Howdy, and welcome to the first lecture for Enterprise Risk and Data Analytics. Let's get started. I've changed the slides a little bit from what's online. We'll deal with that issue later because I've done this to italicize some words, to make some words stand out. We're talking about enterprises, which are any large organizational entity. The city of Houston is an enterprise. The county of Harris County is an enterprise. Uh, Joe's Donuts is an enterprise. The DOD, the various entities, anything that's a large organizational entity that has some purpose. It can be for profit, it can be for nonprofit, but it has some purpose and mission. And every enterprise has some type of risk. During the course of this uh, discussion of this semester, we're gonna talk about reputational risk, we're gonna talk about environmental risk, we're gonna talk about all different kinds of risk and how they all work together in a network and hierarchy to somehow come up with this notion of enterprise risk. What is the risk to the entire legal entity? So let's start with the definition of risk management. Risk management, or we'll call it ERM, is basically the process for which companies identify risk. Okay, let's think about it. That's a big one. We're gonna have to identify risk. Once we identify that risk, we're gonna have to measure what's the probability it's gonna hurt us? How is it gonna hurt us? What's the consequences going to be? We never like to talk about risk in isolation. We like to talk about the risk and the impact. How do we manage that risk? And remember before I said there's four ways to manage risk. We can avoid it, we can accept it, uh, we can mitigate it, or we can transfer it. And then we need to disclose key risk to increase value to the stakeholders. I put stakeholders in red here because I'm wondering, what is a stakeholder? Let's think about it. If you're a private company, your stakeholders obviously are your owners, your customers, but let's expand that definition of stakeholders. If the company pollutes, let's say, then aren't we all stakeholders if we have to suffer the consequences? Is the, the public at large at a, con at, at a stakeholder? What about uh, those that depend on the employees? What about the vendors? So the stakeholder notion I wanna think of as being very big. We'll talk about this in a subsequent lecture that I've kind of uh, invented this classification of stakeholders between uh, primary and secondary and then kind of latent or tertiary stakeholders. The primary being those people or in control who can make decisions. The secondary being those people who are directly impacted by those decisions. And then in my ontology, my classification, the tertiary, the latent stakeholders are those who suffer the consequences but had no direct control or felt no immediate impact. Uh, as an example, Deepwater Horizon. You look at the big companies that were involved in the oil spill, they were primary stakeholders. Then you look at the secondary stakeholders that were impacted, the employees, the vendors, the people along the shore. And then in my, the way I look at stakeholders then is, consequently uh, there were tertiary or latent stakeholders when regulations were changed that impacted companies that had nothing to do with the spill but possibly didn't even operate in the Gulf of Mexico. So when we talk about stakeholders and enterprise, I want you to think about this broadly. So when we talk about the risk management on the enterprise level, we're talking about the big picture. So I like cyber risk, because that's what I do in most of the time. And you talk about a cyber risk, and I've posted on Blackboard an article about cyber risk now being directly related to bankruptcy risk. You know, and when I used to teach cybersecurity risk, I just talked about how you manage the cybersecurity risk and put in controls. and used strong passwords and did patches and complied with all the regulations. Never thought about cybersecurity risk being part of a, a series of actions that could quickly lead to bankruptcy. So as we talk about this, we're gonna talk about a very holistic approach where the parts of the organization are viewed as being interconnected. Nothing operates in isolation. And as our world has changed and become more global and interconnected and integrated, we see more of this. So <coughs> we put in some uh, let's think slides in here and just basically when we talk about a concept, just stop and think about it in your own context. The audience for this class are professionals who work, you deal with risk every day, and I want you to start seeing it differently. I want your, how you feel about risk 
at the enterprise level and how we do data analysis being different uh, um, after this class. So you have kind of a different perspective. So when did we come from ERM? Well, we used to look at ERM and we used to looked at it just purely financial. Did you, did you take uh, advantage of certain opportunities that affected the finances? That was your strategy. Um, could you stay in business? We looked at it as more very almost simplistic, right? But now we begin to realize in the last 10 or 15, 20 years, certain events that we had a very limited notion of enterprise risk management. We weren't looking at the totality and the interconnection and the global. So we're going to talk about some of these. So we realize every system, it says here has its downfalls. That might be better risk as every system has its limitations. And so we look at common challenges that when we, when we introduce ERM and we introduce the notion of that and getting people to understand we need to think on an enterprise viewpoint. So we're going to talk about some of these uh, and what changed. Um, as I get older, I realize I'm <laughs> teaching undergraduates at A&M in my day job that uh, we're not born or we're babies at September 11th, and yet for most of us that was <laughs> a very pivotal event. Um, and most of these that you see here we've selected from the last 15 or 20 years. Let's look at the Basel Accords. Basically, Basel Accords was, uh, it was an attempt at International to um, come up with a better way of global banking regulators to improve risk management pr processes. And why is this? In the old days, you know, when we, we were more isolated, if a bank failed in one part of the world, it had limited effects on the rest of the world. Now, of course, with our interconnection and our global outlook and everything, nothing is very simple. So with the Basel Accords and then later on the Basel II, we, we, we began to look at banking as three pillars. What you needed to have in cash around or capital requirements, what kind of review you had, and the market discipline. All right? We did this to try to bring stability and um, stability and traceability into our banking. And I, I highlight banking just because of this. At the end of the day, we live in a capitalistic country. Everything is about profit and loss. In other words, the number one goal of any company is to make a profit. No matter how good your product is, no matter how good your intentions are, no matter how much you love your employees, if you're not making a profit and you can't afford to pay them, and you don't have a marketable product, you're not in business, okay? So, so I've put some points here. What do these pillars do? They offered standardized or customized methods of calculating capital requirements. Why? Because there were different regulations and compliance in different company, countries, excuse me, and different groups of countries. You know, the EU might have had a set of regulations, different things like that. Then they wanted to, have, uh, to enable supervisors to look at the true risk management practices and the risk exposure of banks to increase capital requirement calculations if needed. So it sounds like, well, capital, isn't that kind of just what's sitting in the vault? Well, that's another issue. <laughs> what counts as capital? What doesn't count as capital? Well, how much of it is in cash? How much do you need to have as a percentage of what you lend out and the like? And then there needed to be market discipline. So if you're in banking, you'll hear quite a bit about the Basel II Accords. Now what happened is after they did this and began to looking for enterprise risk management, they began to include operational risk. Now we're going to talk about the three different types of risk later, but think of them as strategic and operational for right now and financial. Strategic being kind of like think of Apple. Apple is very good at strategy, and because of that, they make a lot of money, right? <laughs> what if they miss that? What if they thought there's no future? No one wants a little device that you can put in your pocket um, to listen to music and miss the iPod, and yet at the same time, they knew when to withdraw from that market and to go to streaming to change the technology. So strategic risk is do you recognize the opportunity and can you execute it? Financial risk is, do you have enough capital and money to keep it going? I might have the best idea ever in the world, but if I don't have money to make it happen, I might have a great strategy, but poor financial. The third is operational risk, and we begin to see more and more the importance of operational risk, which just means how things get done. How does the operation happen? Okay. So with this, the Basel Accords began to look less at the strategic 
and financial and isolation and realize this is the big three. We need to look at strategy, we need to look at financial, and we need to look at operational. And you'll hear me say this quite a bit throughout the uh, course because it's the operational risk that's beginning to cause us so many problems. Um, now, what it says here is these accords were great and it taught a lot, but there's no standard benchmark for risk management practices. And by that, if you don't have a benchmark, if you don't know what the as is is, if you can't figure out a benchmark, then you can't figure out the 2B, where you're going to go. You can't compare different things. You're comparing not only just apples and oranges, but apples to grapes. So while there were some great things that came out of Basel II, we didn't get as much as we could. Now let's talk about September 11th. September 11th, there was a terrorist attack, first major attack in the United States since Pearl Harbor. And I can tell you from personal experience, I was living in Austin, Texas at the time, and I knew a woman who had a very great company. She had a PhD in economics or mathematics or something, and she had a method for calculating derivatives for the financial markets, and she was wiped out. She lived in Austin, Texas. Her company was in Austin, Texas. Her employees were in Austin, Texas. Unfortunately, every one of her clients was in the World Trade Center, and when the World Trade Center went down, her business eventually went down. She could not recover. And we began to look at this for different areas of risk. First of all is obviously the terrorist risk, an attack that can happen, and we call it asymmetrical attacks against civilian populations. The concentration risk, this particular company had all their eggs in one basket, so to speak. All their clients were in a single building in New York City. The complexity of that risk, who would have predicted that an Austin company could have gone down? Or who could have predicted that certain, um, going back to the latent and tertiary stakeholders, something not directly involved in the terrorist attack, but somehow either benefited or was more regulated because of it. And so again, September 11th raised our awareness of an integrated approach to risk management. Now let me give you an aside. I'm a patent attorney, although I don't practice since uh, losing my partner a few years ago rather suddenly. Um, 9-11 <laughs> taught this country a lot. Our NSA National Security Agency, all the offices for the NSA were, ca were in Fort Meade, Maryland. They were all in the Beltway. Uh, our patent office, by law, was in Virginia. There was no backup. So another thing 9-11 uh, taught us, even though it took us several years, is, you know, you've got one critical place for some of these government agencies that really ought to have a backup. So now we have NSA Texas, San Antonio, the second largest NSA site. Um, we have patent offices now, which had to wait until 2013 for a change in statute and legislature by our Congress uh, that became part of another different paradigm shift uh, in the United States because of our patents. We now have offices in Detroit, Dallas, Denver, and Silicon Valley besides Virginia. So took us a while to implement some of these lessons, but we did learn from it. And we learned that the terrorism risk isn't just against the assets or those people that are immediately caught up in it that are, um, you know, killed or maimed or something like that. But it began to say, okay, what about the things that we previously thought couldn't happen? Let's evaluate risk by an organization or the enterprise. And so we began to look at this as part of our business planning, our disaster recovery, our business continuity. When I teach cybersecurity, I differentiate the two. Business continuity means something bad happens, but you have enough left intact that you can move on, continue the business. Disaster recovery means just that. I've had a disaster. <laughs> it's gone. How do I recover? Just like my friend in Austin, company never recovered. She could not come out of a disaster that had, that had hit not her, but her customers. So I've listed this about concentrating, um, relying heavily on one or a small number of customers, suppliers, sectors, and the like, uh, trying to figure out, okay, how do we get along differently from this concentration risk? Uh, where do we put our backup sites? Like now I see with the patent office and with NSA, what makes it sense to geographically distribute within the United States? The like. So again, I want to emphasize that when we talk about an enterprise, we're talking about government entities, we're talking about commercial entities. So, th so I'm using government examples. However, 
Same thing for companies. Companies that are, for instance, I did some work about five or six years ago for, for a company in San Mateo, California. They, by contract, had to have backup sites for the kind of data they were maintaining. They did not keep their server farms, you know, these huge buildings full of uh, computers with all the data, by contract because of what they were doing had to be done within the U.S. territory. They did not keep them in California. They kept one in the Utah area and one much further east. Their idea was that the backups, let's distribute them geographically, let's not look, pick up something that's on the San Andreas Vault, and a subject to earthquake, but then let's go on and distribute the two sites we have because, <coughs> excuse me, the probability of having a, something happen to one was hopefully a much different probability than happening to both at the same time. So we talk about risk of complexity. Now, what's interesting is after 9-11, if, if you were an adult then, I used to love to fly before 9-11. I'd fly into Austin on a Friday night. I would be tired. There would be music playing in the bars because, um, you know, Austin-type groups and could sit there. I'd, my son was also a consultant and wait for him. And then, of course, after 9-11, you couldn't, you couldn't come in and sit and wait for somebody if you didn't have a ticket past the gate. So we made all these changes in flying, and then we made a lot of changes not only in the airports and in the flying itself, the background checks and the like. But then you have people who don't want to fly anymore. <laughs> they don't want to fly. Somebody could uh, take over the plane, <coughs> which, you know, statistically, you, even considering the events of 9-11, you have a much higher uh, chance of being killed in a car accident than a plane crash. But I can't overemphasize, and I know these slides are very wordy, but, um, you know, the potential for unforeseen benefits and consequences. So there were bad consequences for the airline industry, for other things, but then th there's always a business opportunity. So suddenly it's like, wait a minute, why are we flying around people? Let's teleconference. And we had this big push in technology, and then companies realized this was also a great business strategy because, quite frankly, it saved them money. So, so I've talked about this a little bit, but what we began to see is more of an integrated approach to ERM, and that, in essence, is what this, com this course is about. Now, I'm going to have to be honest here and give you a little disclaimer. Do I know all the answers? No. Does anyone know all the answers? Absolutely not. Enterprise risk right now is a very hot topic. I use the word ontology, and I'll explain that further in a subsequent lecture, meaning that I want to build, like, think of this as a taxonomy that's smarter than a normal taxonomy. I want to show how we can link together various parts of risk and how they interconnect. You know, taxonomies are like the biological taxonomy, you know, that the genus, the species, and all this, very orderly. An ontology is not orderly. It may have several links to different things. The links may be dynamic. The links may go away. And I'll explain this later. Don't let this <coughs> scare you by using this word. But what I basically want to say is when we talk about the integrated approach to enterprise risk, don't feel bad if you think, I'm not really sure what she's talking about because, quite frankly, nobody has come up with a good way to do this. We are fumbling around in the dark. We know that we need to do this. We know that risk is not a simple if A, then B. If this happens, then this happens, the way you used to think about it. If the probability of this is to point to, and then this happens, we have this consequence. Now we realize that different events can happen, some with very low probabilities, with disastrous consequences, and yet disastrous uh, for some may be beneficial to others. So we want to look at this and realize, you know, it's kind of a messy uh, area we're in right now. So stop and think for a bit and <laughs> think of a current world event you're passionate about. Can you think of impacts that could have us on, uh, on unrelated sectors? Let me tell you a small thing that happened to me a few weeks ago. I could wear reading glasses. So I'll go into the 99 cent store because they have them for a dollar. I'll buy five or six pairs. Well, I go in the 99 cent store in my neighborhood and they don't have any. And, and they're great. 99 cents if they break them, if I lose them, you know, they don't have any. So I go into another one in my son's neighborhood. They don't have any. Well, I go into one when I'm in Bryan College Station. They don't have any. You know why that is? We put tariffs on things made in China. And suddenly those 99 cent glasses, they're just not worth it. They're just not worth it. So they're not selling them anymore. And I thought, isn't that funny? It's something I would have never thought that there was a link 
between a government policy to put in tariffs and my not being able to get reading glasses. So if you remember 2008, uh, 2008 was one big financial crisis. Enron was another big financial crisis. And so another way we can look at this that is a, something that has changed our notion of enterprise risk is a corporate accounting fraud. Now, what happens when something like Enron happens? First of all, there's devastation. I personally knew three people who were financially impacted, who two of them, um, basically one of the guy was in his 50s, lost everything, another guy in his 40s, you know, lost everything, they had to kind of start over. Uh, another one of them, uh, a third person I knew, um, you know, just devastating results. They were good people, they worked at Enron, they, they thought they were doing the right thing, and then they get caught up and their whole retirement is in this basically Ponzi scheme, right? Account corporate accounting fraud. Then, so Enron, what happened? Legislation changed, right? Talk about the tertiary or latent stakeholders. You put in, we put in Sorbanes-Oxley, we put in different laws, which affected companies that had never, ever been done anything like Enron had done, but they were affected by it. Uh, litigation increased on the, on the board of directors and their personal financial. I did some work uh, once on a risk analysis for Deepwater Horizon, which is the reason I'll refer to it quite a bit. And uh, the board of directors for BP had to hire personal attorneys at their cost to protect them because they were sued by their shareholders for BP who said, you are not doing your job. Your job is to fiduciary responsibility to represent us and make sure the company is running right. And the company did all these bad things that led to this accident. So the fallout, the result in the United States is always we have something bad that happened. Years ago, the reason we had pension reform in the 60s was when Studebaker collapsed. And when they went bankrupt, they had wiped out their longtime employees' pensions. This was before 401k, so they put in pension reform. It's very reactionary. Enron, reactionary, we had SOX come in. Deepwater Horizon, we had legislation change. We actually had a government entity broken into three because of conflict of interest. We have litigation. Oh my gosh, now I'm gonna be on the board of directors. I can be held financially accountable. Uh, and a lot of data breaches, Target, Home Depot, the board of directors are sued by the shareholders for not doing their job. And then of course, they pass legislation and sometimes one argument is, oh, you're asking us to do all this detailed work for compliance and it's not really making us better or safer, but it's providing a path of paper trail, right? But, but that's the way, we have this fallout, it's through litigation, legislation and the like. So, as I said before, the board of directors and companies in that are, if you are in a company that's hit by a cyber risk, make sure you've got your uh, um, insurance up, although sometimes the insurance even says, nope, sorry, we said we were gonna cover if you made errors or omissions, but this was, you know, willful negligence or something like this, so you get these ongoing legal battles that go on. The best thing to do is to avoid them, right? So as it says, serving on the board of directors became less attractive because suddenly you're being held responsible and accountable and, uh, and saying what was being done to protect the company against key risk. Let me give you a story, Target. Their directors were sued, uh, the shareholders sued them and they basically said, look, you were there representing us and you did not have reasonable practices to, uh, for cybersecurity. And so you were negligent on the job you were not diligent, but diligent about the risk of a cyber attack in a retail company. So we have this come up, I mentioned Sarbanes-Oxley, and some will say it's criticized as ineffective. I had a law school professor who said basically the 1933-1934 SEC Act that established the Securities and Exchange Commission, you only needed that, you didn't need Sarbanes-Oxley, whatever. But what Sarbanes-Oxley did is make the C-level suite personally liable, both civilly and criminally. So now when they signed off on accounting, they could be held criminally liable and civilly liable. So it raised the corporate awareness of risk and more important, every time we say the word risk, I want you to think of the word impact. 
if there is a risk and something happens, what is the impact? And begin to think how that impact cascades through the enterprise. So another example, Katrina. You know, I love this. It's a one in a 396 year event. A little over two years ago, a one in 800 year flood flooded my home and I lost my car when Hurricane Harvey decided to uh, flood my neighborhood, which had never flooded. Never flooded. I'd been told, yeah, you're in the floodplain, but this never floods, right? Uh, my, my deal was, if it's going to one in every 800 years, couldn't have waited 700 years when I wasn't around, right? But these worst case scenarios, yeah, this is going to only happen one in 800 years. Oh, wait, it did happen. Again, what is the risk? What is the impact? How does that impact affect the enterprise? Okay? And uh, along with that is natural disasters. You know, you can't, there's a, there's a lot of damage uh, the human beings do because of uh, terrorism and uh, <laughs> other things. But then you have your natural disasters of earthquakes, tornadoes, floods like Katrina was. And so you have to, again, think about what is the risk? What is the impact? What is the overall consequence? I'm going to break here to give you a break, and I'll be back with the rest of this lecture soon. Thank you for staying with me.